Good morning, happy Sabbath day to you. Welcome to the service of worship at Bower Hill Church. Grace to you and peace in Jesus our Lord. Please join with me in the call to worship which you will find in the bulletin that we sent to you. Welcome one another in Jesus' name. For Christ is truly present among us. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. O God, light of the minds that know you, life of the souls that love you, strength of the thoughts that seek you, help us so to know you that we might truly love you, and so to love you that we may fully serve you, whose service is perfect freedom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, yet we are justified by the gift of God's grace through the redemption that is ours in Christ Jesus. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins. Gracious Gracious God, God, our sins sins are are too too heavy heavy to carry, carry, too too real real to hide, hide, and and too too deep deep to undo. undo. Forgive what what our lips tremble to name, what our our hearts hearts can can no longer bear, bear, what has has become become for us a consuming consuming fire of judgment. judgment. Set us us free from a past that that we cannot change. Open Open us to a future in which we can be changed. And grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light light of of the world. world. Amen. Amen. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In him we are forgiven. Amen.
Thank you once again for being with us today. As always, the church is as active as it has always been. Uh, We still have many things going on. We would ask you to check your weekly announcements coming from uh, the secretary from the office here at the church. Also, for the next two weeks, uh, Fred Lazier, Reverend Fred Lazier, will be filling in for me. And uh, you may be getting your weekly link for the worship service from him or from Karen or from somebody other than me. And so I would ask you to read anything you get from the church, uh, just to make sure that you get your link for the next two weeks. Let's pray. Oh God, by your Holy Spirit, tell us what we need to hear and show us what we ought to do to obey Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our reading from the Hebrew Scriptures this morning is taken from Genesis, the ongoing saga of Abraham and Sarah. Genesis 22, verses 1 through 14. I would invite you, as always, to listen for what the Spirit might whisper to your heart in this admittedly very disturbing reading from the book of Genesis. After these things, God tested Abraham. And God said to Abraham, Abraham, And he said, here I am. God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood on the altar. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. The angel said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by its thorns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, The Lord Will Provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. May God bless to our understanding this reading from God's holy word, and to God's name be glory and praise. Please join in the responsive reading of Psalm 30, or I'm sorry, Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I am shaken. But I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because God has dealt bountifully with me. And our reading from the Gospels today is taken from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 10, verses 40 through 42. 
Again, listen to what the Spirit might say to you in this reading from the book of Matthew. Jesus is speaking and he says this, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. After these things, God tested Abraham. Small comfort to know it was just a test. God said to Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And later, Isaac, his own son, says to him, to his father, father. And Abraham responds with the same words, here I am. And yet again, in the same account, a third time, somebody says to him, Abraham. The angel of the Lord calls from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham responds, here I am. Three times in this harrowing passage from the book of Genesis, someone calls out to Abraham, first God, then Abraham's own beloved son, Isaac, the child of laughter, and finally an urgent angel trying to stop Abraham before he does anything rash. And each time, Abraham responds with the same words. They are words that are spoken throughout the pages of the Bible. At times when the Spirit comes to call, it is the response that the faithful give to God. Here I am. Here we are. They're words that sound strangely chilling and almost robotical within the context of this unsettling narrative about human sacrifice. They are words of availability. They are words of self-giving. They are words of undivided attention. Words of self-surrender. Spoken in all sincerity to God and to child and to angel alike. Here I am. And though this is one of the most disturbing stories in all of Holy Writ, and though I have spent the greater part of the last two decades avoiding this story of the binding of Isaac, let us do our best to push past its terrifying imagery to the question that it poses. For at its heart, this ancient account probes a timeless issue, an eternal question. What do you withhold from the one who gave you everything? In a world where all things must be received as gifts, Gifts of grace, gifts of time, gifts of God. What would you try to maybe conceal within the folds of your robe when you arrive at the pearly gates? To whom and to what are you fully available, truly available? To whom or to what do you really declare in all sincerity of heart, here I am. In a few moments, we will tackle the hard question of, you know, child sacrifice in the Bible. But before we do that, let's talk about the way parents so often treat their children as little extensions of themselves, as little second chances for mom and dad to accomplish all the things in their children's life that they did not get to accomplish in their own. Nearly all of us have at least some experience of this phenomenon, for even if you do not have children, you have been somebody's child. And though parents try hard to resist the urge to live on through their kids, most succumb to it from time to time. And this may be one of the keys to grasping the complex dynamics that are at play in the story of Isaac. Have you been to a children's sporting event in recent years? There's always one dad, at least one, and sometimes a mom, pacing anxiously on the sidelines, screaming at the coaches or umpires or referees. 
Some of them even interrupting to ask why his or her own child isn't getting more time on the court or on the field. At the girls' softball games years ago, while my own daughter was always, always stationed in the outfield, lying down on the grass, staring up at the clouds, caring not a whit about the game, you know, playing softball pretty much the way I would, someone else's daughter would be up, at the, up to bat. And I could just see the near panic in that poor kid's face. This was not fun for her. She wanted so much to make her parents proud. She wanted so much not to disappoint her pacing father, for whom it is about winning, 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 doing better than your teammates, being the best, being known as the, the girl's softball champ of the second grade. Isn't there supposed to be joy? in the game, but some parents came to it with so much of their own history, so much of their own baggage, that it ruined some of the fun. Old dad, red in the face, fuming to himself, I missed my chance to be Roger Clemens, but my kid, my kid's going to make it. Sometimes it's academics. My kid's going to have straight A's, win all the spelling bees, do Odyssey of the Mind, be enrolled in summer programs at the library. My kid is going to be in honors courses and take and be a member of all the brainy clubs and spend summers learning to play the oboe at Chautauqua. My kid will be the valedictorian and have membership in Mensa and get an academic scholarship at least to one of the seven sisters, if not an Ivy League school. Maybe I only got two years of community college, but my kid? My kid is going to be a brain surgeon who writes symphonies and finishes the New York Times crossword puzzle in under 10 minutes, the Saturday edition. A parent's great need to redeem his or her own past might give their poor child ulcers. And all the kid wants is to go to grandma's house where he or she can ride their bike and go swimming and maybe use a double negative from time to time. The classic African novel, Things Fall Apart, by Chinua Achebe, explores this phenomenon also. Things Fall Apart is to African literature what A Tale of Two Cities is to English literature. I read the book long ago in high school sociology class, and I didn't like it. Not A Tale of Two Cities, I didn't like it either, but I'm speaking of Chinua Achebe's book, Things Fall Apart. I was 16 and I had no idea yet that my life would end up taking me to Africa for half a decade. At the time, I didn't have any patience for fiction that was not set in Victorian England. Also, I thought Achebe was a little hard on the missionaries. But I read the book again this past March, 20 years after coming home from my African life, and I loved it. I absolutely loved the book. Its subtleties were wasted on me back in high school, but since reading it, I have now ordered many of Achebe's other works of fiction on Amazon. Things Fall Apart is about the Africa that was, just on the brink of the arrival of the missionaries that changed the social fabric. It's about the vagaries of a changing world and the pain that is visited upon anyone who cannot or will not adapt. But it's also a story about parents and children, specifically fathers and sons, and the ways that some fathers will try to live their own life or the life they never got through their children. Okonkwo is the less than lovable main character in the book in those 19th century days when the British arrived in Nigeria. He's a tough guy, he's a warrior, and a social climber. He always wants to work harder to expand his fields, to cut down more forest, to plant more yams. He always wants to prove himself in battle, to kill more enemies, to gain more wives, to have more children, for those are the marks of manhood in his mind. It becomes clear throughout the course of the book that Okonkwo is haunted by memories of his own father, a gentle, peace-loving, dreamy, talkative man who hated hard work and who shied away from combat and battle 
but who excelled at playing the flute in the village festivals. Okonkwo wants nothing more than to be everything his father was not, and so he rides his own children very hard, always driving them to fight, always driving them to be strong, to be silent, to be hardworking, to be unemotional. In a time and a place where there was no real concept of an afterlife, one lives through one's children. One lives on into future generations via posterity. And that might be a key. But for all of his so-called toxic masculinity, Okonkwo drives his eldest son right into the arms of those hated missionaries where he becomes very much like Okonkwo's father. (laughs) Very much like everything Okonkwo hates. This, I think helps to explain just a little bit about the world that is depicted in our reading today from the book of Genesis, where one's child is not just one's child. One's child is one's self. One's child is one's future. One's child is one's afterlife. The dreaded story of the binding of Isaac is perhaps one of the most famous and least loved stories in the Hebrew scriptures. Believers in blood atonement do like it, for to them it prefigures Christ on the cross. And the parallels between those two stories are uncanny, I must admit. Right up to the details about on the third day, and the thing about Isaac carrying the wood on which he would be sacrificed, just as Jesus would later carry the cross. Except that in that understanding of the Christian Gospels, it is God who both requires and is the sacrifice. And I have to admit there's a kind of beauty in that. If you can get past the notion of a God who requires blood, especially the blood of a child, and that is a very big if. Most of us cannot accept the idea that a God who bids us love and forgive each other, would also bid us kill an innocent being for the punishment of our sins. But this story was written in a time and a place other than our own. It was written in a time and a place where child sacrifice, though not practiced by the Jews, was not altogether unknown. How can we penetrate the darkest depths of this ancient account? Consider this. Abraham had no expectation of an afterlife. Such notions only came along with the Greeks much, much later. Abraham's only hope for the future was that he might live on through his child. His one child left, for he has released the other, Isaac, the son of laughter. Much like Okonkwo, Abraham expected to die and pass from remembrance, except through his child, his lineage. You and I, of course, would rightly say in our day, that child's life was not his to give. What kind of a God would even ask for such a thing? Better to serve the devil than a God like that. Small consolation that God was only testing Abraham, that the whole thing was a bluff, and that a ram appeared to be sacrificed instead. That's its own issue. And Isaac... His name is ironic enough, for it means he laughs. Poor Isaac never seems to recover from this traumatic event. At least one New Testament scholar believes that it made him strange. It made him silent. It made him detached. He is the least accomplished of the Hebrew patriarchs and matriarchs. He doesn't get many speaking parts after this. According to some ancient traditions, Isaac never spoke to his father again after this incident. In other traditions, this weird occurrence led to the death of Sarah, his mother. For you and me, it's just all too bizarre. The bloodthirsty God who speaks directly to people and the demands of such a horrible, and who demands such horrible things. The very idea that God would ask for the death of a child. This is not the God that you and I worship. But let us find comfort in this. Theologies and worldviews are forever changing. P. 
people of good will down through the ages have had understandings of God that would look alien to you and me. They never believed that God would actually demand a human sacrifice. Our theologies change with the times. God doesn't change, but our understandings of God do. The book of Isaiah alone Throughout the course of the book, you see changing theologies. It begins by saying, our God is the best of all the gods. And it ends by saying, there's only one God. Theologies and worldviews change. But in the time and the place where this account was penned, Abraham expected to live on through Isaac. Isaac was more than his child. Isaac was his hope for a future. Isaac was his afterlife. And thus God was asking of Abraham everything. Absolutely everything. His future, his calling, the great nation that had been promised to him, his afterlife, his identity, his way of being remembered in the world. God was demanding annihilation of Abraham. In offering his own child, as unthinkable as that is to us, Abraham was being called to offer everything of himself, his own life, all his hopes, all his wishes, his dreams, his desires. Give it all back to the God who wished it into being in the first place. You and I cannot easily come on board with the trappings of this story because it flies in the face of things that we hold dear. But In a world where your child really is you redux, this is a tale about giving yourself fully and finally to God. And three times in the course of this distressing account, the obedient Abraham responds with, here I am. Here I am. And so, let's push past the messiness of this narrative to read the eternal question at its heart. What do you sacrifice, truly sacrifice, to your God? What part of yourself do you give? To whom or to what are you fully and truly available? To whom or to what do you say in all sincerity of heart, here I am, I'm here for you? Availability. Availability, it's the greatest gift you can give anyone, isn't it? Availability in this age of text messages and phone calls and emails and the bombardment of endless information. To whom and to what do you really respond? Here I am. We, we all want to live forever, don't we? We all want to be remembered for something. But more than that, we hope that somewhere in the greater life of God there is a place for us that extends beyond the realm of time. A place where our consciousness lives on, but redeemed from all the stuff that haunts us, all the temporal things that break us, the things that make us angry or sad or scared. Failing that, at the very least, many of us will try to live on in the patriarchal way. We'll do it through our kids, God help them. Or you could make a nice statue of us. That'd work. Oh, come on. You knew I had to weigh in on the statue statue issue, didn't you? You knew I had to weigh in on this whole issue of statues being pulled down and dumped into rivers. Truly, I could not care less about those statues. Don't get me wrong. The arts are a magnificent way to experience the sacred. They are an expression of the divine. And I like a nice sculpture myself. But maybe there's a reason that the whole thing about graven images is the second of Ten Commandments. You know, for 500 years, we Presbyterians have been warning people about getting too attached to statues. For that matter, what kind of nation memorializes its enemies anyway and allows statues of traitors to encumber its public places? For that is what Confederates were and are, traitors against whom our great-grandfathers fought and shed blood. There is in the cemetery in New Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, a statue statue of the unknown Union Civil War soldier. 
My grandmother used to stroll with me among the graves there, and always she would tell her grandchildren that if you come to the cemetery at midnight and you ask that statue what you can bring him as a reward for his valor, he will say nothing, nothing at all. I remember being frightened by that as a child. (laughs) Yes, we all hope to touch the future, even if only by way of a statue erected in our honor or headstones in a graveyard, or perhaps legacy giving. I do not discourage that. In fact, I would encourage that. We try to live on through the differences we've made in this world, through the kindnesses that we have with our living sewn into its fabric, the lives that we've touched for the better, the people we've influenced with our wit or our wisdom or our generosity or our faith. If we have children, We may try to live on through them. My godson in Cameroon has become an evangelist, the likes of which I quail to behold. I never asked him to convert when I was there to my moderate and very polite brand of Christianity, but he did, and he went further. Now he's got converts in Cameroon and Burkina Faso and France and Canada twice. His followers have flown him to France so that he could uh, lead, what would you call them, revival meetings. He speaks on the radio and on television. And he speaks in tongues and he talks about healings and miracles and casting out demons and all kinds of things that I never believed in and certainly never taught him. If you look through my list of friends on my Facebook page, you'll see that more than half of them are young Africans, people that I have never met, and they call me their grandfather. Francois, my godson, calls me his father, and in the old African way, these young Pentecostals call me their spiritual grandfather. And I look at all of it and I say, wait, wait, what? Did I do that? (laughs) To think that I, a staid liturgical neo-Calvinist, who can in no way endure shows of emotion, should be remembered as a forefather of Cameroonian Pentecostalism. And yet, and yet, I kind of like it. I kind of enjoy it. We can touch the future and live on in ways that we never expected, ways that we never intended. Indeed, everything we do, all of our life choices, will touch the future, will they not? A future that you and I will not live to see is being shaped daily by the choices that we make. Everything from the big things to the decision between paper and plastic, we will live on most fully, most truly, in the things and in the ones to whom we have said with all sincerity, here I am, I'm yours. I'm available to you. We will live on in the things and in the ones to whom we have made ourselves truly and really available. Sacrifice. We hear too little about it. Sacrifice. We're making sacrifices to things every day, but not everything is worthy of the sacrifices that we make. You will be known not by what you take from this world or how much you take, You will be known by what you give, or what you tried to give, or how much you give, or how much you tried to give. You will be known by whom you welcomed to your table, whom you loved, how much you loved, how much you spent in unselfish pursuits. This is why Jesus is known by a table. For at a table he included the outsiders and sat as an equal among the outcasts and broke bread with them. You and I, we did not ask for these days that we have been given. We might have asked for other days. We did not ask for these days just as Isaac did not ask to be born in such scary and such strange times as he lived. Sometimes I would just like to flee, find a secluded place and flee from the troubles of the world. But we cannot. 
as followers of Christ, we have a calling. Ask yourself this in all sincerity. What sacrifices are you making for the sake of our world today? What parts of yourself are you truly offering up on the altar of the world? Offering to the thing or to the one that you most truly worship. Our broken society tells us to take what we can and take as much as we can. But the quality of life that Jesus in the book of John calls abundant and eternal, that comes not from what we take, but from what we give. Sacrifice. Sit with this question this week as you read the news and as you ponder the troubles of our days. Am I giving enough? Am I giving what I can? Am I giving what I need to give? Am I sacrificing anything to make it better? My time, my energies, my resources, my white privilege. In order to be whole, you must engage in costly sacrifice. To whom or to what are you truly available? To whom or to what do you say in all sincerity, Here I am. Here I am. Amen. Let us bow our heads and join in a moment of prayer. O God of grace around us and within us, God from whom our blessings come, God to whom we in the end return, blessings and all, hear our prayer for your church and for people of faith in every place. We pray that we may worship you and serve you faithfully. For leaders and for people in every land, that those who govern may govern with wisdom and with grace, with mercy and with love. That they may know your will and your way and that they may do it. We pray for justice throughout the world, that there may be peace and plenty for everyone. We pray for the earth that you have made, that it may flourish in beauty and show forth your glory. We pray for all those who hunger and thirst, for all who are ill and who are frightened. Let them be filled with good things. Visit them with your peace and let that peace spread. We pray for those who are sick or close to death and for those who care for them, that they may all know your loving care. Especially today, we pray for those who are dear to us. We pray for Jeff Carper, for Denny Geis, for Nancy Geis, for Mary Gorski, for Jim McAnulty. We lift up in our prayers, most especially today, the family of Juliana Gennaro and her classmates and friends in South Fayette. We pray for the Harmon family as they move back to Ohio, for Andrew Astorita, Jeff Conte, Tommy DeSantis, Francie L. Hummel, Melody Cronwald, Tim May, Brian McFeely, Rick Miller, Luann Pattison, Virginia Reinstatler, 
Sarah Stovall. And in the silence of this moment, we would name before you those who are always near to our hearts. Receive all these prayers, O God, in the tenderness of your mighty hand and strengthen our hands to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, who teaches us when we pray to say, Our Father, Father, who art art in heaven, heaven, hallowed hallowed be thy thy name. name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, come, thy thy will be done, done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, bread, and forgive forgive us our debts, debts, as we forgive forgive our debtors. debtors. And And lead us us not into temptation, temptation, but deliver deliver us from from evil. evil. For thine thine is the kingdom, kingdom, and the the power, power, and and the the glory glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. We are so glad that you joined us today. We thank you for being here. We ask that you would continue to join us every week and participate in worship as it will make normal as much as possible these strange times in which we live and as it is our our duty to, to worship and to love God and to do so together. And so thank you. Receive the benediction. Go into the world knowing compassion and seeking justice. Give voice to the silent Give strength to the weak. See one another, hear one another, love one another. It is as simple as that and indeed very hard. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you from this time forth and forevermore. Amen.